this is take three on this. And uh, I'm hoping to get those of you that might have missed because you're sick because you were sick earlier this week caught up uh, pretty quickly. And I'm hoping that things actually cooperate this time. Um, so just kind of follow along with me. Uh, the thing to keep in mind with the first new deal, which is what I would title this um, if you're looking for a title, um, either the first new deal or chapter 13, is that it focuses on short term solutions to the problems that we're faced with in the Great Depression. Uh, what you're going to remember is what you're going to want to remember a couple things off of this slide, even though there's there's just the one bullet point. Uh, first is that FDR is kind of the first president to really popularize the idea of the first hundred days in office. Um, he felt like his first hundred days were going to be very, very vital that he once elected had to show um, the country that he meant business in terms of uh, solving the problems of the depression. And secondly, and in part, what he wanted to do during that 100 days is to address what we call the three R's. And those three R's are relief, recovery, and reform. Okay, um, And that's the quote that we talked about uh, from when he was running for, for office, and that is that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Um, so he's going to be focused on relief, recovery, and reform. It's a little bit like if you uh, kind of like, um, not necessarily when you're sick, because you can't always help uh, when you get sick, but if you get injured uh, doing a particular activity, you break your leg or you, you hurt your back or what have you, one, you want pain relief. You want that immediate relief of whatever it is that's bothering you. Um, secondly, you need to recover. So whatever injury has occurred, you have to, you have to rehabilitate it um, and, and strengthen yourself back up to where you were. And then you have reform where... You, you, you've gotten relief, you've recovered, and now if, if you want to make sure that, that whatever injury that you sustain doesn't happen again, you need to reform or you need to change the way that you were doing things um, in order that whatever it was that befell you doesn't happen again. That's a good way to think about what we're going to talk about here during the Great Depression is that idea of, of relief, recovery, and reform. And here we're going to really kind of focus on mainly relief and recovery um, and then on Monday, when we start back up, we'll move into the reform. So the first thing that uh, Roosevelt does uh, to start addressing some of the issues uh, that pop up uh, in the Depression is he declares a bank holiday. Okay, uh, March 6th through the 10th, he's going to declare a bank holiday. Now, he does this for a couple reasons. One is to stop massive withdrawals. Okay, And we talked about this. I'm not going to go into great detail right now. Um, but we talked about this in class, uh, is the idea of these bank runs. In other words, uh, when the stock market crashed uh, in 1929, even if you didn't have money in the stock market, you would have paid attention and you would have think, seen that things were not going well um, in the financial world. You would have wanted to go to the bank and get your cash on that you had in there out of the bank because, well, quite frankly, there's just something that, that's reassuring about having the physical cash um, in your hand. And what would end up happening is you would get people that would go to these banks to withdraw their money. And as it turns out, banks do not keep all of the money that is given to them on hand. They take that money and they invest it and in the form of loans for homes and cars and, and education, things like that, to start businesses, etc. And so what happened is there came a certain point at various banks around the country where people would go and withdraw so much money that the banks would literally run out of cash um, and they would have to shut down um, because they just did not have any funds uh, to reimburse people and people lost their entire savings. So the first thing that this bank holiday does is people can't withdraw money if, if, if the banks are closed. Um, and then secondly, it's to sort of inspect the strength of the banks, um, which is a little bit less important for our purposes because quite frankly, uh, we know that the banks are not very strong. What Roosevelt then establishes is this thing called the FDIC. With a lot of these different acronyms, I'm not necessarily going to require you to write down um, what they mean, but you need to have some idea of what they do. So the FDIC stands for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, and basically what it does is it insures your savings um, or the money that you have in banks up to $5,000. Now, that information that... that talks about today it's 250,000 that is inaccurate today I believe it's 275 or 300 thousand um, dollars and this is all part of something called the Glass-Steagall Act 
And the idea behind the Glass-Steagall Act, the idea behind the FDIC is confidence. You're going to bring confidence back to banking, okay? You want to bring confidence back in banks because if the banks, if people are not putting their money in banks, the banks cannot then invest that money again to people who want to buy homes, to people who want to start businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So when people withdraw their money from the bank, it's not just the bank that gets hurt. It's anybody who wants to use the bank uh, to start a business or buy a house or do something like that. So the way the FDIC works is they say, um, if you invest your money in the bank and the bank goes under, in other words, the bank goes out of business, it runs out of money, then the federal government will reimburse you up to $5,000. So if you invest $2,000 in the bank and your bank goes under, the government will reimburse all $2,000. If you invest $6,000 in the bank, we won't reimburse all of it, but we will reimburse $5,000 out of the $6,000 you invested. Brings a lot of confidence back uh, to banks because now I don't have to worry about losing everything. Um, FDR also wants to increase the money supply by taking the U.S. off the gold standard, okay? Now, what's important to note is that this causes inflation, okay? Because you know, all of our money, you know, the dollar bills and the quarters and things like that, the 20s, they all have backing, okay? And that backing is precious metals. And up to this point in history, 1933, we had been on what was called the gold standard, meaning that the United States government had stores of gold that served as the backing for all of its currency that's out in circulation. Well, the problem with, with that is that there's only a finite amount of gold out there uh, to be had. So if you wanted to increase the money supply, in other words, the supply of bills that are out there in circulation for the public to have, you have to have some other backing for it. You can't just print more bills because that causes inflation that dollar is no longer worth as much as it was before. The same thing happens, though, when you, when you go completely off of the gold standard because now we really don't know, well, how much silver is worth this much gold and how much copper is worth this much gold and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, again, meaning well, but causing some smaller problems along the way. Now, ultimately, what is successful is that these things do help in the short term in that idea of relief. And the FDIC really becomes not only relief, but a form of recovery and a form of reform. Um, so some of these things, and this is something that I didn't really point out to the other classes, to the, to the other students that were here that I should, is that some of these things can apply themselves to more than just one of the three R's. Moving on to some of the other alphabet soup agencies in the New Deal, and this is a term that you're going to need to kind of remember um, is alphabet soup because all of these agencies are going to become known by some acronym, okay, by either a, a series of three or four letters that uh, sort of clues you in as to what they're doing. So like the CCC, for example, they're going to pay young men um, to go around and help keep up parks, forests, etc., uh, it's probably the most successful part of the New Deal in terms of uh, the government-created programs uh, to help people out. And when we talk about parks, we're talking about, like, if you've ever gone to Turkey Run or one of our state parks here in Indiana and wonder, well, who goes around and sets those railroad ties that create some of those steps on the trails? Well, that, that was people that worked for the CCC. Why are they young men? Well, quite frankly, young men are, are generally single, and they're generally unattached, meaning that they don't have a family, so they can move around really as they want. We also have the AAA, which is designed to help farmers, and the way that it works is that the government actually pays farmers to limit the production of their crops, okay? And the way that this works is it, it, it's very simply supply and demand. It's, it's, a, it's a price control mechanism. Um, by which, and I can kind of try to draw this the best that I can, you have a supply and demand curve where we have price, the price of a good, and then we have the quantity of a good, okay? Um, the demand curve looks like this because the higher the price, the less quantity you're going to want to buy of it because it's more expensive. The lower the price, the more of a quantity you're going to want to buy of it. So this is the demand curve represented by D. And then you have the supply curve represented by this. And it's a little bit trickier as to why the supply curve likes, looks like this, 
but we're really got, not going to worry about that right now. What we want to worry about is this thing called equilibrium, where these two curves intersect right there is called equilibrium, and that has a corresponding price and a corresponding quantity. Now, the corresponding quantity is not as important, but the, cor the corresponding price is. So what happens during the depression is this price, this equilibrium price, is not enough for farmers to be able to make ends meet. You have farmers that, as it says here in the notes, and I'm going to go ahead and underline this for you, you have farmers who cannot make mortgage payments. Okay, In other words, they can't pay off their farms. All right, um, And so what happens is, is that they're having to sell their farms and, and people aren't able to, to farm anymore. So what the government does through the Agricultural Adjustment Act is it pays the farmers money, don't plant your crops or don't purchase more livestock or don't sell more livestock. Well, what happens is you move that supply curve inward, okay, or to the left, actually, and it's your new supply curve because at every price point, you're offering less supply. Well, now what that means is that we have a new equilibrium. And that new equilibrium price is higher than the old, meaning that the farmers that are able, the farmer, the crops that farmers do plant and harvest and then sell are worth more money. Okay, and we'll talk more about the AAA later. Um, I hope that that isn't too confusing um, in terms of the diagram. It's really not my best work, um, but it's kind of the best that I can do um, with my uh, with my mouse. So. We're going to go ahead and move on uh, to, this will be our last slide that I'm going to cover in here, because this will get you fully caught up. There's this thing called the NRA, I went too far. There's this thing called the NRA, and this is one where it is kind of important that you write down, uh, that you actually write down what this one stands for, because this is not the National Rifle Association, okay? When we get to the NRA down here, we're talking about the National Recovery Act. We have this thing called the, the Public Works Administration. And the idea with the Public Works Administration is that you have private companies that are going to build roads, other public structures like bridges, um, even aqueducts, um, things that bring fresh water into cities. That's an aqueduct. And that is all, um, that is all also part of the National Recovery Act, that NRA, which arranges for competing businesses to work together to set fair prices. The operating hours obviously is, 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 is there as well, but what's important is setting fair prices. Um, both of these are a part of the National Industrial Recovery Act or the NIRA. It's not something that I'm going to have you necessarily write down. Uh, and the idea is, um, that we're trying to, instead of having businesses, you know, try, trying to make as much money as possible, the NRA is going to try to emphasize to businesses, hey, you need to make your products affordable. We talked about in class that this is in a way kind of a reverse, um, kind of the reverse of a cartel, whereby a cartel um, comes together and they, they engage in price fixing to make sure that uh, the business makes as much money as possible. In this case, this is kind of the reverse, okay, where you have businesses that are working together Instead, instead of making as much money as possible, they're working together to make sure that goods are cheap enough for the general public to purchase them. Um, I think that is going to get us caught up um, with where everybody else is. Um, so that way, when we start our notes on Monday, when we start back up with this, hopefully you guys are not completely lost. Um, again, from here, uh, my suggestion would be uh, to go ahead and move on to that alphabet soup uh, worksheet. Don't worry about the political cartoon assignment for now. Um, get the alphabet soup worksheet uh, at least started, uh, hopefully finished within the hour this morning, um, and then we'll see you guys on Monday. Uh, hopefully everybody's feeling better by then.